Let me show you an example um, for the demonstration of the of the eigenvalue type solution that we have uh, that we have summarized. Now remember what that scheme that what that the procedure is going to, is trying to do is it's starting from some generalized picture, a state of stress that on which we have all the possible normal stresses as well as all the possible shear stresses and that picture is with respect to say x, y, z and it's trying to reach a compli complicated orientation that is hard to predict complicated orientation of the normal stresses of the of the principal um, of the principal stresses, so that's the principal picture. The orientation is complicated. It's not something that I can immediately deduce. That's the one. That's the two. That's the three direction. There's a general rotation, and I'm trying to find what the normals to these planes are and what the values are together, which they will eventually determine um, this principal picture. And so that is a method. Notice that is very general. It works in this very general scenario in the presence of all the stresses and therefore it would also apply to the case where let's say the shear stresses on the plane with normal z is not there. That would be a generalized state of plane stress. Now it does fit in this scenario and therefore I could still apply the same method. So now this method is a bit more cumbersome. I have to go ahead, calculate the determinant, etc. But still, it applies to generalized plane stress, stress scenario as well. And hence, also applies to the state of plane stress. And therefore, one notice, in general, if I have, if I can uh, recognize, right, a state of stress to be, let's say, generalized plane stress, okay, um, then it would be preferable to use the methods that we've discussed based on the Mohr circle. But the method we've just summarized based on the determinant, the eigenvalue approach, is always valid. It's valid for any stress state, so it's the most general approach. It's a bit cumbersome, but it's most general. But when the state of stress is arbitrary, then that's the only method I can use. So it's very general, we just keep that in mind, it always works, but when possible, we want to use the simpler method. Now, nevertheless, for the demonstration purposes, we're going to solve a problem uh, which is based on a state of stress with sigma x equals 100, sigma y equals minus 60, and sigma z equals 40 goes without saying here all my units are mpa and the shear stresses are tau xy equals 80 tau yz is equal to 0 tau zx is equal to 0. Now we notice that there is only one shear stress that is 0, non-zero, okay and therefore, I immediately recognize that there is going to be a state of generalized plane stress with respect to the x, y plane. So in other words, the z direction is the direction of generalization, right? If it were also zero, the stress, then I would, be, I would be dealing with a plane stress scenario. So here it's a state of generalized plane stress. So I could certainly use more circle approach but let us go ahead and use the principal stress approach in this particular scenario. So um, now we do not have to, um, uh, let's say, memorize the resulting equation of that eigenvalue approach, the determinant approach, but we have to remember the form, we have to remember what it means. What we are doing is we're expressing the equilibrium of a tetrahedron, an arbitrary essentially orientation of one of these planes. We take that plane, map it onto there, and we look at its equilibrium. Equilibrium means that eventually the sum of the forces along every direction is going to be zero. Okay. Now, the plane is identified with a vector, which is a unit vector, Okay. Uh, that identifies the normal to the plane, so I keep in mind that L squared plus M squared plus N squared is equal to 1, okay? 
and that vector is multiplied by the stresses that contribute to forces. The stress is, as a matrix, is going to appear explicitly there, sigma xc. So in fact, let me go ahead and write the values automatically. So I will have here sigma x, which is 100, and then tau xy, which is 80, and then tau xz, which is 0. By symmetry, this is going to be 80, that's going to be 0. And then sigma y, which is minus 60, and then tau y, z, which is 0. By symmetry, that's also 0. And then sigma z, which is 40. But we subtract in equilibrium a sigma from the diagonal entries. So that's the system of equations. So that's equilibrium. That's the condition of a unit vector. It's just stress matrix minus on the diagonal the normal stress I'm looking for, the direction of the plane, equilibrium enforces that to be equal to zero. So that I think is, um, is it's, it's a fair enough requirement to sort of remember that. Um, so now I have to impose the condition that the determinant of this matrix is supposed to be equal to zero. So this matrix, we called it earlier matrix A, now I have to uh, ensure that the determinant of that matrix should be equal to zero. So what I want to do is I want to write the determinant of that matrix, set it equal to zero. So you may remember there are multiple ways of finding the determinant. Let me just remind you one way. In that way, I will first of all identify a uh, row, and my row will be this one. And to that row, alternatively, I attach plus and minus signs to every entry. So the first entry, it is 100 minus sigma, which I'm seeking, and it is multiplied what with a plus sign. Okay, now this thing is going to multiply something else, but let's keep that in mind. The second entry is 80, multiplied by a minus sign, so there's going to be a negative, it's going to multiply something. Okay, so 80 multiplying something with a minus sign, and then plus 0. In general, it doesn't have to be 0, it could be something else, and you're going to write that something else in case you have a value that is not 0 there. Um, so then what you do is you identify uh, all individually um, submatrices associated with that entry. So for that entry, the submatrix would be this one. And you go ahead and evaluate the determinant of that entry, of that submatrix, and put it into the corresponding um, parentheses that multiplies the corresponding item. In that case, it's this entry. That item is 100 minus 60. So the... Um, the, the um, determinant here is that minus that multiplying that minus this multiplying that. So it is uh, 40 minus 60 sigma multiplying minus 60 minus sigma minus zero. Okay. Um, so the second entry has 80. So I would cover the corresponding row and column and I would evaluate it, its determinant, which is 80 multiplying 40 minus sigma minus, again, 0 times 0. Okay. And the third one, it's this one. It is 0 multiplying 0 times 80, which is 0, zero minus 0 times that, which is, again, 0. So the third entry doesn't really uh, give me anything. So, right. And so you have really a simple equation. There are many zeros here. You can go ahead and easily um, um, simplify that equation. And eventually, you would end up with an equation that looks as follows. You would obtain um, here, equivalently, okay, determinant of A would be equal to sigma cubed minus 80 sigma squared minus 10,800 sigma plus 49600, okay? So that's essentially this equation multiplied with a minus sign. Okay, this is a minus sigma cube that I would obtain here. I just multiply with a minus sign. So that's supposed to be equal to zero. And now I go ahead and solve for the three roots. The three roots that I would get from that equation would be um, eventually sigma one. Okay, now we are gonna order it in a fashion that um, is somewhat arbitrary. So 
sigma 1 is that, sigma 2 is minus 93.1, and sigma 3 is 40. 1, 2, and 3. So three roots for a cubic equation. Okay. Um, so those are the values of the principal normal stresses. And now what remains to be done is to go ahead and calculate the directions. All right. Now, notice that we've picked those ordering actually according to the following, um, following convention. So I already know that I'm dealing with a generalized plane stress. So sigma z is actually equal to a principal direction already. That's sigma 3. So therefore, I expect one of the roots actually to come out to be 40, which it did. So that's a verification of the calculations that I've done. Um, but also I would expect that the third direction should be in the z direction. Okay, So in the out of plane direction, if you like. Now, therefore, since the third one is a cross product of the first and the second ones, the first two directions, the principal directions, should be lying within the plane because one cross two is supposed to give me the third direction, the third direction is the z direction, that's out of plane that enforces the first two normal directions, principal directions, to lie within the plane of the paper. So, um, that is what I should obtain. So, these vectors principal, corresponding principal vectors should have the th third component being equal to zero. Okay, so let's see if that's what we obtain. So first, we go ahead and try to use the value of 133.1. You take it, plug that in there, and you go and look at the equations. The first equation would be, so here I'm going for sigma 1. So for sigma 1, the equality says that 100 minus 133.1 multiplies L and then 80 multiplies M and 0 multiplies N, no need to write it, that should be equal to 0. That's the first equation. The second equation says 80 multiplies L and then minus 60 plus 60 plus sigma or 60 plus 133.1, I took the minus outside, multiplying m, n multiplies 0 again, should be equal to 0. And the third equation says that 40 minus 133.1 multiplies n, that should be equal to 0. So from that equation, first of all, from the very last one, I would immediately deduce that n must be equal to 0. And that's what I expect. This vector should lie in the xy plane because it should be perpendicular to the third principal direction, which is the uh, z direction, which has, which I expect has a, a vector which is 0, 0, 1, okay, along the z direction. And then I look at these equalities. Now, if you look at these equalities and scale them, you will see that you will end up with exactly the same um, equation and that equation tells you that so sorry let me go ahead and put indices one here to indicate that we're dealing with the first direction so what we would obtain is the same equality which says that l1 is actually from these two the same result l1 is 2.414 times m1 this type of a situation is typical in um typical in um eigenvalue problems and there isn't a apparently a unique solution and I don't expect it to be because determinant of a is zero a is not invertible this matrix but I can impose a unique solution by imposing the requirement that the vector I'm dealing with is a unit vector so if I impose now l square plus m square plus n squared equals one okay so n1 is equal to 0, l1 is a function of m1, so this will give me an equation in terms of m1 only, and from therefore, from that, you can find that m1 uh, square is a certain value. Now, I can always pick the plus or the minus value. Let's go ahead and pick one value. It doesn't matter whether you pick a plus or minus. Um, I pick the plus one. As soon as you pick the plus one, you go back and you can determine L1 to be 
0 0.924. So apparently, therefore, sigma 1 goes with a vector which is equal to L1, 0 0.924, M1, 0 0.383, and the third entry is 0 because it lies in the xy plane just as I expected. So now you can go ahead and do the same exercise for sigma 2. And for sigma 2, if you do the same exercise, you would obtain that the corresponding uh, special directions satisfy minus 0 0.383, m2 is 0 0.924, and the third entry is 0. And you can take the cross product of these, and you would, of course, get a unit vector which lies in the third direction, just like we expected. Okay. Um, so, just for your reference, remember that this here is the cosine of the angle that this vector makes with the x-axis, this with the y, this with the z. Right? So, therefore, the angle that this third entry is making, the angle it must be 90 degrees, cosine is 0, that's expected, we're in the plane, xy plane. And from the other two, you could find the corresponding angles that each make with the with the um, with the corresponding direction. So, for instance, in the first case, I would obtain that um, this is an angle of, or this is the cosine of twenty two point five degrees. Okay, which means that if I go ahead and rotate through an angle of twenty two point five degrees I would reach a plane with maximum normal stress equals sigma one it's a principal direction and that value of the angle is therefore what you should also obtain if you were to do a, a more circle solution of this problem okay and we can certainly do that as well. But that is the way that is a, uh, that's a demonstration of the very general eigenvalue approach through the determinant that works just as well. And yes, in this case, it's sort of uh, forcing the scenario too much because it's actually a simple setting. But ultimately, it's a procedure that is always valid for more complicated stress states that we could also encounter in practice.